through the garden, across the lawn towards the French window. It is the same way that I took the other time. I had no real hope of success that day. I knew in my heart that Lily Dale would refuse to marry me. And now... I am fool enough to try my luck again. Are the prospects any better than they were? I think not. Worse, perhaps. For the man she was in love with was married then, but now... he is free. Well... I have come this far. I shall ask her a second time. But if a second time I am refused... why then... I shall never ask her again. No, John. Major Grantly left us on Tuesday. Tuesday? But that was the day he came. He breezed in and breezed out again. Did he not, Grace? Yes. Yes, indeed. He seemed a very pleasant fellow. Oh, yes, we think he is. Grace herself is leaving us first thing tomorrow. Really? That is a little sooner than you had intended. It is. I'm afraid that my father has been taken ill. I'm very sorry to hear it. I suppose this wretched business of the cheque has helped to bring that on. Yes. He worries about it a great deal. And last week he went up to London and he found that very tiring. He was seeing a relative of the family. Well, of course, a relative of your family also. Mr Toogood. <laughs> Uncle Thomas. Yes, we know each other well. Uncle Thomas, I assume, is to act as lawyer to your father at the trial. I believe he's willing, if Papa would consent. Very willing. Now, Johnny Eames. Yes, Lily. I feel very much in need of some fresh air. If I take a walk, will you accompany me? It's a pleasant day. <laughs> yes. And it is very good of you to share it with me. Oh, nonsense. I am always glad to see Johnny Eames. Wait a moment. I'll pick some flowers, a parting gift for Grace. When I came to the small house that time before, she would not walk with me. But today she is keen, suggests the idea herself. Does this bode well? I think not. Where I should have taken the leading hand, Lily has instead. She has been brisk and businesslike, has ensured the occasion lacks... Romance. You know, Lily, whenever I come, you tell me you are glad to see me. And so I am. Very glad. But you mustn't interpret the remark to mean more than it says. Dearest John, if we could be like brother and sister... No, it can never be like that. Well, perhaps not this year or the next. But it will happen... And I will wait for it patiently, no matter how often you may rebuff me. I have not rebuffed you. Not maliciously, it's true. I have never rebuffed you, Lily. My crime, I sometimes think, is that of persecuting you. Telling you the same whining story, asking, asking, asking. And always, of course, being refused. And when I think about my crime, I feel ashamed and swear that I will do it no more. You need not be ashamed. And yet, dearest John, do it no more. Well, that is not so easy. For at other times, you see, I think my fault must be that I have not tried hard enough. Oh, John. So many years I have longed to make you mine. At first, of course, I, I knew that the money I earned was not enough for us to live on. Also, I was such a fool, I was almost tongue-tied whenever I met you. And then... Mr. Crosby came down here. Do not speak of him, But I Johnny. must speak of him. I can't be silent when my whole world's at stake. Oh, pray then, do not speak ill of him. Well, I have no need to do that. You may judge him by his deeds. I suppose he loved you. But he certainly didn't love you as I have done. I at least have been true to you, and I am true to you now. Lily, I love you with all my heart. And all my strength and all my soul. Lily, my dearest, I want you to be my wife, and my only hope for lasting joy is that you will become so. Say the word, therefore, and make me the happiest fellow in all England. Say the word, here, at once. Oh, John. One little word will do it. Half a word. A nod. A smile. I wish I could. 
Oh, I wish I could. I hope you will excuse my troubling you. Oh, it'll be no trouble at all, Mr... Um, Too good. If I can be of any use. The dean and his wife, I take it, are still on their travels. They are. Oh, dear. Uh, Mrs. Arabin, by the way, is my younger daughter. Uh, my name is Harding. Mr. Harding! Uh, I have heard much about you. Oh. You are a former warden, I believe, of Hydum's Hospital. Yes, that uh, is... Correct. <laughs> May I ask, sir, the reason for your visit? I have come about Mr. Josiah Crawley, the curate of Hogglestock. Ah, and do you come as a friend? All together as a friend. Oh, I'm glad of that. And as a relation, too. Mrs. Crawley and I are cousins. Indeed. Do you know Mr. Crawley? Uh, very slightly. Uh, he is not much given to social habits. <laughs> okay. But uh, Mr. Arabin, my son-in-law, is a, a very close acquaintance of his. So I understand, which is a reason why I am anxious to communicate with him. Uh, Mr. Harding, I am a lawyer, uh. and I wish, through what legal skills I possess, to do what I can for poor Mr. Crawley. Oh. Uh, he is rather a... Queer fellow. Someone ought to write a book about him. <laughs> but I do not believe that he intended to steal that money. Nor I. Indeed not. The temptation, admittedly, was very strong. There was a butcher in Silverbridge, I gather, who was badgering him. Mr. Toogood, all the butchers in Barsetshire couldn't make an honest man steal money. <laughs> and Mr. Crawley, believe me, is an honest man. Exactly. I cannot marry you, Johnny. You don't love me, then? No, not as I love him. I can't help it. Can't change any more, it seems, than you can. When I sleep, I dream of him. When I am alone, I cannot banish him from my thoughts. And I suppose I shall think of him to the very end. I used to feel proud of my love, though it made me feel so wretched. I am proud of it no longer. It is a foolish weakness, a feebleness of spirit. But you, Johnny, with a man's strength, should not suffer so. Indeed you shouldn't. Well, I do, whether I should or not. What is left to us, then, but to pity each other and swear that we will be friends? I shall go back to the house now. Yes. Lily... What if Crosby were to come to you again? He would come to me in vain. You would not marry him? No, I don't think I would. In fact, I am sure I wouldn't. I won't marry him. And I won't marry you. And there can never be another. So all those dreams of love and marriage and a house of my own... And children, and a wedding ring that gets tighter as I grow fatter. All that is finished. When I get home, dearest John, I shall write in the little book that I keep. Lillian Dale, old maid. And if those words are ever proved false, Johnny Eames, you may come and ask me for the page that they are written on. You see, in a matter such as this, one has to rely so much on rummaging about and making do. Uh -huh. Some theatrical managers, I gather, make their choice of plays according to the costumes that they happen to have in the wardrobe. Do they really? I would never have thought of that. And we lawyers, Mr Harding, are often obliged to do the same. But not with your clothes, Mr Toogood. <laughs> Oh, no, no. <laughs> With our information. Many a time I've got a guilty fellow off by dint of the little scraps of detail I've found. Oh, dear, dear, that doesn't seem right at all. Would it not be better for guilty fellows to be punished for their faults, um, gently, I mean, so as to warn them of the consequences of such doings? 
Perhaps. But my business, Mr. Harding, is to get such fellows off, and I get them off where I can. Mm -hmm. And so it is with Mr. Crawley. Though he is not a guilty fellow. I trust not, but he needs to be got off just the same, which is why I am come to Barchester to rummage around. In respect of Mr. Arabin, who knows? He may have something to say which will serve Mr. Crawley's defence, ah. as may your daughter also. <laughs> Mr. Crawley still thinks, or half thinks, that the cheque was somehow given him by the dean, though Mr. Arabin, I understand, has written to deny it. I wonder, Mr. Harding, if you can tell me when the two travellers are expected back. Uh, let me see. Um, the uh, 25th of April, or, or the 26th. Mr. Arabin is in the Holy Land at present, mm. and Eleanor is travelling in Europe. Yeah, so I had heard. Mm. Even if their return were not delayed, there will be but a few days before the Assizes. And that's no good, I fear. Oh. Can't wait that long. Mm. So, my dear, you've been to Allington? Yes, Papa. Is it a pretty place? Yes, Papa, very pretty. Were they good to you there? They were very good. Had they heard anything about me in this trial? Yes, they had. Oh, no. They think badly of me, I suppose. No, Papa. They suppose that there's been a mistake, as we all do. Oh, my dear, they do not try men of the sizes for mistakes. Well, you were mistaken. And the magistrates were mistaken also in sending you for trial. You did not mean for one moment to do anything that was wrong. I hope I didn't. You see, Grace, when people are not themselves, when their minds have gone astray, they're liable to do such things. I'm not myself. I am mad. No, Papa. Oh, I think I am. If that is, one can be mad and yet able to recognise madness when one sees it. Mr. Toogood thinks I am mad. I'm sure he does not. Your mother thinks it too, though she never says it. But perhaps I should indeed give up my duties as the bishop has directed. I, I believe I would do so, you know, if it were not for her. Who, Papa? Mrs. Proudy, the bishop's wife. She who makes herself great by her husband's littleness. So, Grace, let us agree that I am mad. Papa. I have been driven to it, I suppose. Life has been unkind, and its cruelties have at last unhinged me. Indeed, when I think of all that I have endured, it's a wonder that I was not mad years ago. I will never abandon her. She says she won't marry. Well... Nor will I. Many faults I have, I confess. But whatever else I am, I am constant to Lily Dale. And shall remain so. I will write to her each year, on the same day of the year, year after year. A very simple letter. Each perhaps the same. Reminding her that I am true. That I am waiting and at last, who knows, I may perhaps prevail. Guestwick. Of course, that's where your mother lives. Mm, that's right. Well, well, I wasn't far from there last week. I spent a little time in Barchester. Ah, nothing to do with Mr Crawley, I suppose. <laughs> Everything to do with him. I met Cousin Grace, you see, and she told me you might be giving some help. Hmm. Johnny, I'll give what help I can in this affair, though he's an awkward customer, is Mr Crawley. Mm. Doesn't make life easy for himself or others. But I decided to go down to Barchester, rummage around and see what I could see. And what did you see, Uncle? Oh, this and that. I don't know if you're familiar with the affair. Uh, Mr Crawley is accused of stealing a cheque that belonged to Lord Lufton. Oh, no, no, not Lufton, but Lufton's agent, a man called Soames. Now, 
One of the things I discovered was that on the day that Soames visited Mr. Crawley at Hogglestock Parsonage, uh, when the cheque was lost, you know, uh, he was taken in a carriage that was hired from an inn at Barchester. The inn is called the Dragon of Wantley, and it is owned by Mrs. Arabin, the dean's wife, having been left to her by her former husband. And I spent some time at the Dragon to see if I could find the driver of the carriage. And could you? No. He's living in New Zealand, left a few months back. So that's not much help? Perhaps not. Still, every stone must be unturned. He is asleep at last. Well, that is a relief for him and us. His mind was wandering, Mama. One moment he was talking of Mr Arabin, and when they were at Oxford and how he used to butter his toast for him, the next... He was telling me I must go to the bishop's palace and inform Mrs Proudie that he would not obey her. He has been very ill, my dear. But he's a great deal better, I believe, since you were home. You were more of a comfort to your papa than I can be. You can read Greek tragedy to him, and you can talk to him without making him angry. But I am sorry to have brought you back from Allington. Oh, but you mustn't be, Mama. I would sooner be here to share your troubles. Mama, while I was at Allington, Major Grantly came to see me. Did he, my dear? He was there to ask me to be his wife. My darling child! Oh, and what did you say to him? Well... God I... bless the man he has seen with a true eye and acted with a noble spirit. Did you know that he would ask you? I thought he might. So you had made up your mind what to say to him? Yes, I had, but that was before all this happened to Papa. So that when Major Grantly asked me, I did not say it. Oh, Mama, he is so gentle and so kind. And I do love him. How could one not love him? How indeed. I love him for loving you. But you see, Mama, one must not hurt a person one loves. And for that reason, I told him I could not be his wife. Oh, Grace. Did I not do right, Mama? Must I reward his goodness by bringing shame upon him? If he loves you, Grace, then his reward is your love in return. Oh, that is all very well in books. But I don't believe it. If I married him, I would be unhappy. And so would he. And anyway... This is no time for being in love or thinking of marriage. I am very grateful that he asked me. And very proud. But it cannot be. So, Uncle, you need an emissary to the Arabins. Well, it might prove useful. Otherwise, I fear, they might be back too late to help us. Of course, uh, sending someone will be expensive, but it will be worth it if it proves a help to Crawley. I can think of a way of lessening your expense. Can you, Johnny? Yes. I'll go and pay my own way. You? Can't you trust me with the job? My dear boy, of course I can. But you could be travelling for weeks. What about the income tax office? Oh, it'll survive. Will the chief commissioner grant you leave? Oh, he'll make a fuss, I'm sure, but he'll give in. Well, I'll tell him it's for a comparative study of tax-gathering methods in foreign parts. <laughs> <laughs> but... There's the cost to consider, Johnny. It'll be forty pounds at least, a, a lot more if you go as far as Jerusalem. Yes, but I'd be seeing the world. I'll pay half. You'll pay nothing, Uncle Thomas. I've bags of money. So, Uncle, how soon must I start? What is it your mother does, Miss Vancina? How does she get her money? Well, since you ask, she gets her money by lending it. Aha. Uh -huh. And she's in with Broughton and Musselbridge, you know? There is a sort of partnership, I believe. But her name's not on the door, you know. She's not an active partner. Well, Mr Dalrymple, nor is Mr Broughton, from what I hear, is as likely to be seen with a bottle of claret as with pen and ink. But the business isn't all money lending, is it? Mr Broughton, I believe, likes to call himself a stockbroker. But whatever the business is, it won't thrive under him, not according to Mamma, at least. Oh, by the way, have you told Mama yet? About the painting, I mean. No, 
N- no, I haven't. If I do tell her, she won't allow it. So you won't. Good. Oh, sorry I've been so long. You see, Mr. Dalrymple, I've been sorting through my jewellery. My view is that if Mama doesn't want to be deceived, she ought not to treat me like a child. Oh, my dear Clara, you are so outspoken. And anyway, Mr. Broaden's not been informed and the picture's being done in his own house. Ah, well, that is because poor dear Dobbs is so careless with the secret. If I told him, then everyone would get to know, including your mother. She must know sooner or later, I suppose. Yes. And so must Mr. Broughton. Yes. Until then, what fun. Mm -hmm. I do love conspiracies. Now, my dear. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mrs. Broughton, what are you doing? I thought for your picture the jail might wear a necklace and some earrings. No, no, no. The wife of Heber the Canite would have had no jewels, I'm certain. No, and even if she did, she wouldn't have worn them. Not when there was all that fighting going on. Oh. Uh, Very well, then. The wife of Heber the Canite will not have jewellery. But why is she allowed to wear Clara's Italian silk scarf? The painting must remain a secret from my husband. He has his suspicions about Conway, you see. And if he were to find out about the painting, he might draw an over-hasty conclusion. He might think that the whole enterprise was set up to encourage Conway's attachment to me rather than put an end to it. Oh... (sighs) Dobbs Broughton is a fine man, and I do not like to deceive him. But he has to work hard, I'm sure, to make so much money, and he's bound to be under a great deal of strain. It wouldn't do to cause him unnecessary anxiety. Pass me a cigar, Musselboro. What? Cigar. Oh. I don't think you should smoke this morning, Broughton. Not here. Why shouldn't I? Because Mrs. Van Siever will be arriving soon. Well, what do I care? If you think I'm afraid of old Mother Van, you're very much mistaken. Cigar, please. Oh, very well. Come what may. Oh, thank you. She will not have me under her thumb. What's she coming for, anyway? Her money, of course. She was due it at Christmas. Yes, so? Well, this is March. If she's frightened of having to wait a week or two, she's in the wrong line. Can she have the money today? Of course she can't. And she has no right to press for it, the nasty old user. Well, she likes her money. Oh, yes. And she likes anyone else's she can get her hands on. If you ever want a downright leech, you know, you should always go to a woman. She's owed £915, according to this. I dare say she is, Mussy. But £915 she is not getting. She won't like that at all. Then she can lump it. And you can tell her so... (laughs) Oh, you're not staying? No, I, uh, I have an appointment. You should stay if you can. Why should I? I can come and go as I please. Unlike you, Musselburgh, I've no wish to be dependent upon Mrs. Van Siever. Unlike you, I'm not hoping to marry her daughter. But I should warn you, even if you do marry the girl, you won't get the mother's money. She'll stick to every shilling of it till she dies. And she'd take it with her, too, if she could. Well, Mussy, enjoy yourself. Aha, uh-huh, she's caught you. Call the police immediately. Well, if you'll forgive me, Mrs. Van Siever, I'll leave that task to my colleague. I have to be off. Uh, urgent business. But don't worry, I've been through everything with Musselburgh. He knows what to do. Uh, why the police, Mrs. Van Siever? Uh, have you been robbed? No, but I would have been if the cab driver had had his way. I offered him two shillings for his trouble, and he refused it. What? Uh, you were coming from South Kensington? Yes. Oh, I always give three. Then give him three, Mr. Broughton, if the fellow's still there. But it'll be out of your own pocket. Oh. Uh, goodbye. Who has been smoking? He has. I don't like men smoking over their work. He ran off very fast, didn't he? Why was that, Mr. Musselboro? I suppose if he did run off, that it was because he didn't want to see you. Hmm. Aren't things going well? They could go better. He's idle, is that it? Yes, confoundedly so. Does he drink? Like the devil some days. But that isn't the worst of it. What is the worst of it, Mr. Musselboro? He bets on the horses. What? Whose money does he use? I don't know. And I'm not sure that he does, either. If that man is taking my money and using it to gamble with... Oh! I mean, surely, Mr. Musselboro, 
You must have some idea whose money it is. Well, the problem is, Mrs Van Siever, that since the money isn't my direct responsibility, I can't keep a hand on it. Whose money is it? If you were to press me, I'd say it was yours. <gasps> no. Uh, though I can't be certain. Then I'll have to go into it myself. And if I find out he's been betting with my money, then I'll have him drawn and quartered. Pass me that ledger, Mr Mosselborough. Well, Conway, what do you think of Clara Van Siever? Hmm? Well, she's very handsome and very clever. And she probably has a temper. What woman worth a straw does not? She would resent it if she were ill-used. I don't doubt that for a moment. But there is plenty of feminine softness in her, I'm sure, if she's treated with kindness. Conway, why don't you ask her to marry you? Why don't I? Hmm. Well, there are one or two reasons. Can you not think of any, Mrs Broughton? No. No, I cannot. None, at least, that should weigh with me. It would be better if you were married. Better for whom? Better for all of us. No. No, not for me. Not unless a certain gentleman were to die first and I married his widow. Conway. That is a very, very wicked thing to say. You must go now. Oh, why the hurry? He told me I might stay on a while. I did, and you have stayed on long enough. Very well. Would your husband be so very angry, do you think, if he discovered our secret? A about the painting, I mean. He might be. Men are very unreasonable, in my view. And they are also very thoughtless. All men? All the men that I know. In your case, for instance. Yes. You would not willingly do me any injury. Certainly not. And yet you wouldn't think to save me from one, to rescue me from dishonour. You would happily, thoughtlessly take advantage of my friendship, of my fondness for you. I have asked you to leave, Mr Dalrymple. Please hurry and do so. Hmm. Hello, Broughton. Huh? Oh... It's you. What the devil are you doing here? Oh, just uh, collecting something I left behind at your splendid dinner party. You're always here. <laughs> no, no. Well, you're here a damn sight more often than I like. Really? Uh, I'm sorry about that. Yes. Or if you're not, you will be. Oh. There's nothing wrong, is there? I won't have you in my house, Dalrymple. Understand? Perfectly. I'm on my way. What has happened to the Commission of Inquiry? The Commission of Inquiry, my dear? Oh. I don't believe anything has happened to it. No, nor do I. And yet we agreed, Bishop, that the ecclesiastical investigation into the shameful conduct of the curate of Hogglestock must be instigated without delay. Did we not? Uh, we certainly thought it would be advantageous if the inquiry were established with uh, some expedition, certainly, yes. But, uh, you see, my dear... These matters are never quite as simple as you might suppose them to be. Nonsense. You could convene the commission today, if you wished, <laughs> and that felon Mr Crawley could be deprived of his duties and offices before the end of the week. Well, um, you see, there is a difficulty. I myself could not be the head of such a commission. Why not? Because by canon law, my dear, such a commission must be headed by the appropriate rural dean. Who is the appropriate rural dean? Dr Tempest of Silverbridge. Dr Tempest? But he is very old, is he not? Well... And also, he was one of the magistrates who allowed Mr Crawley to go free on bail. Oh. It is clear that he is neither trustworthy nor cooperative. Now, why don't you name an acting rural dean? No, my dear. Mr Thumble, I think, would be a sensible choice. My dear, that will not be possible... I will write to Dr Tempest and inform him of the commission. Well, if it must be Dr Tempest, write today mm. and summon him to the palace. Tell him he must be ready to do his duty. Mm. 
I am about to pay a call on Miss Madalena Demolines, the young lady, quite young lady, whom I met at the Broughton's dinner party. To tell the truth, I'm ashamed of myself. It is not yet a week since I was in Allington. Not yet a week since I talked with Lily, told her of my undying love for her, my constancy. And here I am, on my way to Porchester Gardens to spend the evening with Madalena. Yes, and I will call her Madalena before the evening is out, I promise you. Well, why should I not have a bit of fun? Why should I not amuse myself? With Lily, it is love. With Madalena, it is pretending. And that's the difference. So perhaps I should be half ashamed of myself. No more. Mama, I'm afraid, will not be able to be with us this evening. Oh, that's a disappointment. Once more. What is it this time? She has been touched with rheumatism. Dear, dear. And only yesterday it was that I saw her in Piccadilly and apparently in good health. Oh, it comes and it goes, you know. As you do, Mr Eames. No sooner are you back from wherever you were than you are getting ready for a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. That is true, Miss Demolines. Though I have not become a holy man quite yet. It is very vexing, your going away again. Is it in truth? Yes, Mr Eames. And I shall tell you why. I was hoping at last that you might exercise some restraint upon your friend, Conway Dalrymple. What a fool that young man is. And so vain. Well, I wouldn't say he's vain. Of course he is. How can he not be vain if he goes about in a purple velvet coat? I shan't defend the purple velvet coat. Like all artists, Mr Dalrymple is weak and he needs guidance and protection. Mr Eames, that picture he is working on... You must put a stop to it, as you promised you would. Yes, but, you see, Miss Demolines, I don't quite understand what harm it's doing. You understand full well. Well, why shouldn't Conway paint Miss Van Siever? He has painted Lady Glencora Palliser and Mrs Broughton and any number of women. Painting women is his particular business. Yes, Mr Eames, but in his particular business, does he customarily work without payment? Does he use, as his studio, a married woman's sitting room? Does he customarily go about his labour in such secrecy? Well, he has not been very good at the secrecy, that's clear. Mr Eames, do you want your friend to come to grief? Do you wish to bring ruin upon Mr Broughton's domestic hearth? I can't pretend that I care much for Mr Broughton, and I know very little about his domestic hearth. As for Conway Dalrymple, I think he can take care of himself. Well, I have no such confidence in Maria Broughton. Though I would never say a word against her. She was once a dear, dear friend of mine, and I will not desert her in her hour of need. Mr Eames, may I count you as a dear, dear friend? There is nothing on earth I'd like better. Then show your friendship. Please, Mr Eames, before you go on your travels, speak with Mr Dalrymple. Tell him he must put an end to this appalling intrigue. Do you promise you will? Madalena, I promise... If you don't take care, Johnny, my lad, you'll get in a scrape with the lovely Madalena. What sort of scrape? One day, as you walk away from her house, you'll have to congratulate yourself on becoming engaged. <laughs> oh, come on, Conway. I'm not such a fool as that. Ah, but it's not just fools that are caught, you know. Oh, you find it all very amusing, of course. Not that amusing, to be honest. But a fellow must have something to do in his spare time. Mm, such as getting married. I warn you. There was a man she was friendly with last year who was threatened with breach of promise. Oh, yes. What did he do? Fled to Canada. No, no, I won't go there. Italy, perhaps. Oh, which reminds me. I still have a suitcase to pack, and I must be up first thing. Mm. Well, then, arrivederci. Have a good trip. Um, you said you had something very important to tell me. A message from Miss Demoly. Oh, uh, yes. But it can wait till I'm back. Mm. Dr. Tempest, it is of the utmost concern, as I'm sure you will agree. What is, madam? This dreadful business concerning Mr. Crawley. If something is not done, and done soon, the whole diocese will be disgraced. Of the man's guilt, there can be no doubt. 
And since he is guilty, how can he be judged fit to preach from the pulpit of a parish church? I mean, surely you agree with me, Dr. Tempest, surely. Mrs. Proudy, I think we had better not discuss the affair. Not discuss it? Why ever not? Well, madam, if I understand the bishop aright, he wishes that I should take some step in the matter myself. Oh, of course he does. That is the reason, indeed, why he has asked me to be in his study at eleven. Of course. Therefore, Mrs. Proudy, I must decline to make it a matter of common conversation. Common conversation? <laughs> Dr. Tempest, I should be the last person in the world to make it a matter of common conversation. God forbid that it should be so. I am speaking with great seriousness and solemnity with reference to the interests of the church, which, in my view, will be greatly endangered by having among her active servants a man who is guilty of so base a crime as theft. Now <sighs> think of it, Dr. Tempest. Theft. Stealing money. And then telling such terrible falsehoods about it. And can anything be more scandalous? So you see, Dr. Tempest, I do not regard this as a matter of common conversation. Even so, madam, I must tell you that I cannot discuss it. But are you not here to discuss it? With the bishop, but... in his study at eleven, but... not with you. I am not here to discuss any such matter with you. Were I to do so, I would be guilty of a very great impropriety. Oh, Dr. Tempest, let me assure you, these things are always shared between me and the bishop. That is as may be. But, madam, they cannot be shared between you and me. Will father not see me? Of course he will see you, Henry. But I thought that if the news were to prove disagreeable, it might be better for all of us if I were to break it to him. Did you go to Allington, my dear? Yes, mother. And did you see Grace Crawley there? I did, mother. And I asked if she would be my wife. Oh, Henry. Well, she refused. This, I suppose, will not be too disagreeable to father, nor perhaps to you. Henry, my dearest. Oh, but I tell you, mother... She refused me in such a way as to give me hope that she may yet accept me. She loves me. Of that much I'm certain. And so I have decided that I will wait till after this business with her father is finished, and as soon as the trial is over, I will go to her and ask her a second time and hope for a better answer. Dr. Proudy. Dr. Tempest. And Mrs. Proudy. Mm -hmm. Again. I am very grateful to you both for inviting me to the palace and for your kind hospitality. However... Yes, Dr. Tempest? As to this particular meeting, my lord, I would prefer it if you were to communicate your wishes to me in writing, and I will then see if I can comply with them. Ah, well, but you see, Dr. Tempest, I thought that perhaps we might understand each other better if we had a few words of quiet conversation upon the subject. No, that is impossible. Impossible? I fear it is, in the uh, present circumstances. Oh. Well. My lord... I feel myself compelled to say something which ought, for reasons of delicacy, to be left unsaid. But the plain fact is, my lord, that I cannot take any part in a discussion on this matter while we are in the presence of a lady. Dr. Tempest, what is your objection to my being here? My dear, perhaps you would be kind enough to leave us for a few moments. But surely I am not to be dismissed from your room without a reason. Oh. Cannot Dr. Tempest understand that a wife may share her husband's counsels as well as his troubles? If he cannot, then his own household, I think, must be a very poor place indeed. Dr. Tempest, Mrs. Proudy takes the greatest possible interest in everything concerning the diocese. Evidently so. Uh, my lord, I have no wish to provoke any difficulty or to interfere between you and Mrs. Proudy. I can only repeat, if you communicate in writing, I will take what action I can. You mean to be stubborn, sir? Yes, madam, if you wish to call it that. My lord, 
I advised Mrs. Proudy before this meeting that I could not discuss this matter with her, or at least I tried to advise her, and I am extremely sorry that I failed to make her understand, for otherwise this unpleasantness might have been spared. Oh, I understood you very well, Dr. Tempest. I understood you, sir, to be a most unreasonable man. My dear, I really think you had better leave us. No, my lord. Mm. It would be most unseemly if I were to be turned out of the room by an offensive word from a parish clergyman. Dr. Tempest forgets his duty, but I will not forget mine. And if he refuses to take on this commission of inquiry, there are many other clergymen in the diocese to whom we can turn. No, no, my dear, it must be the rural dean. If you would write to me, my lord... His lordship will not write! The matter will be discussed. My dear, I do wish you wouldn't. I do, indeed. Please, go away, my dear. No, my lord, I will not go away. Please! No, no, my lord, I will go away. Oh. Forgive me, but it is clearly for the best. My lord, I wish you good day. And a good day to you, Mrs. Proudy. Oh. A most stubborn and a most obnoxious person. I do not think I have ever met anyone so rebellious or ill-mannered. He is worse than the archdeacon. I hope that you agree with me, Bishop. I expect you to do so, you know, for the sake both of my peace of mind and of my position in the diocese. Bishop? I do not know how I can ever show my face again. You have disgraced me. What did you say? You have disgraced me. Disgraced you? You disgrace yourself by speaking in such a way. Are you trying to insinuate, Bishop, that I have done wrong? Yes, you have done wrong. Great wrong. And not just in this, but in many other matters, too. Oh, I wish I had never come to Barchester. I wish I had never become a bishop. I see. After all my endeavours on your behalf, this is how I am to be <laughs> rewarded. If you have been disgraced, Mr. Proudy, it is not of my doing. Your dignity will never lose anything in my hands, I assure you. I only wish, Mr. Proudy, that you could take as good care of it yourself. Of course it is not for myself that I am concerned, not chiefly, though it is certain my standing in the county will be irreparably damaged. My dear, that is absurd. There is not a person in Barsetshire who would regard Henry's marriage in that light. I do, Susan, as do all right-thinking people. Oh. But as I say, it is not for myself that I am concerned. It is for Griselda oh. and Lord Dumbello. Imagine, if you can, the injury that will be inflicted on them when they find themselves related to the daughter of a Thief. But such considerations, in truth, are not much likely to move you, for it is clear that you are in league with Henry. No, Archdeacon. In your heart, you approve of the marriage. No, Archdeacon, I do not. You are, at any rate, not inclined to oppose him. That much is true. Well... I am so inclined. Indeed, I am determined to do so. If he marries that girl, good heavens, if he marries that girl... Archdeacon, do not say words which you will later repent. I will say words which shall make him repent. He shall be cut off entirely. No. He shall never have a son's inheritance from me. No, do not make threats in anger. Do not say nothing till you are calm. I am calm! No, my dear, you are very angry. But you ought not to be, for the news is not disagreeable. The marriage is by no means imminent. It may be that it will never even take place. The young lady has, after all, refused him. Yes, yes, in the safe knowledge that Henry will ask her again. Archdeacon, that is very unfair. In my opinion, she has behaved very properly. Uh, perhaps. Anyway, I've nothing against the girl herself. Nothing. 
I care not whether she is good or bad. Were she preparing herself for sainthood, I would still be opposed to the marriage. Her I do not judge, but my own son, to whom I have ever done a father's duty and treated with a father's affectionate indulgence. Him I judge, and him I condemn. It's good. It's very good indeed. I can't tell yet. No, I can. I don't think you've ever done anything better. <laughs> what? Not even Maria Broughton as the Three Graces? No, Conway, not even that. Miss Van Siever is rather late, is she not? I hope she hasn't given up on us. The reason that the picture is so very good is that you have put your whole heart into it. Mere skill or even genius can never produce great work. It calls for something more. The artist's pulsating heart must engage with its subject. His soul must be uplifted. I don't think so, Mrs. Proughton. Elbow grease is all that's required. And today, as ever, I'll work on the background till she comes. It isn't nearly right yet. I understand. You mean you'd rather I didn't speak to you? <laughs> no, Mrs. Broughton, I didn't mean that at all. Well, why should I want to disturb you? What I have to say matters so very little. Indeed, words between you and me cannot have any importance now, can they? I don't see why they shouldn't. Oh, I do. They can never amount to much more than the hellowings and goodbyings of common conversation. Can they? <sighs> My dear Mrs. Broughton, your words have always been a joy to me. You know they have. Joy? If there has been joy between us, it has been infused with danger. Do you think so? Oh, we should never have met. Conway, how I wish we had Well, I don't. I never wish away the happiness of my life, even if it is to be followed by misery. Misery? Yes, misery. Look at me, Conway. Look at the colour of my hair. Here, look. Grey. That's not grey. It is grey hair, and I am not yet thirty. Shall I tell you what has turned it grey? They say hot rooms will do it. Hot rooms? No, Conway, rather a frozen heart. Your heart, Conway, which for others beats fast, is on fire, inspires you to do great work, which for me is chilled ice. You are not much younger than me, but you, Conway, are stepping out in the world, whereas my world is ending. Conway. Yes, Mrs. Broughton. May I still speak to you as a friend? I hope you will always do that. Well, I make no such promise. I will always, it's true, have a friend's interest in your welfare. But friendly words, Conway, are sometimes misunderstood. Never by me. <laughs> no, I suppose not. Never by you. We are quite safe there. You see, Mrs. Broughton, I have never been vain enough to suppose that there was any other feeling between us... Other than friendship, I mean. In the past, I confess I have hoped that I might win something more, but... Uh... Conway, no! I'm sorry. Oh, no, that was very wrong. Yes, it was. It was very wrong. You must not say such things. You will do such damage. Uh, Mrs. Broughton, forgive me. I would not hurt you for all the world. Oh, I am indifferent to injury. My life is a blank. My heart can be broken no more. No, when I talked of damage, I was thinking of someone else. Your husband? Well, that my husband would be heard goes without saying, but I meant Clara Van Siever, the poor girl whose likeness you have captured. Ah, and she has arrived, I think. The poor girl who is devoted to you and to whom you, I do not doubt, have whispered words of affection, words which, if you meant them, ought to have made it impossible for you to speak to me in the manner you did just now. Yes, I do apologise. Have you whispered such words to her? Well, you know, I've, I've made a start. Oh, good. Good, and, and, and you must go on. Indeed, you must. My dear, dear friend. Mm. Ah, Miss Van Siever. Good morning. Clara, at last. We were beginning to think you were never coming. <laughs> <laughs> Mama, I have got such news to give you. I met Uncle Christopher while I was in the village. Oh, yes. How is he, my dear? In good health. I'm very, very pleased. He said he would drop by later, if you may, but I told him that I couldn't wait and would have to steal his thunder. Well, Lily? Bernard is to be married. Indeed. <laughs> to whom, my dear? To a young lady who has connections in Barsetshire. 
Her name is Emily Dunstable. I don't believe I know her. Oh, she is the niece of the Miss Dunstable who got millions upon millions by selling ointment. Oh, yes! <laughs> and who married Dr Thorne. Well, and your uncle is pleased, you say? Oh, he is. It seems Miss Emily Dunstable will be due some portion of those millions, and that makes a bit of difference, you know. <laughs> but you mustn't joke about the ointment, by the way. <laughs> I'm sure I won't. Uncle got a little cross when I did, and he said that there was no need to mention where the money comes from. <laughs> oh, but there's more yet. News, I mean. Uncle Christopher is going up to London to see Cousin Bernard and his bride-to-be, and he thinks that I should go up too. For a whole month. Lily. Shall I, Mama? Oh, if you wish to, Lily, you must. Miss Van Siever, your right arm should be a little further forward, please. Like this? Further still. Oh, but I'll fall over. Well, if you lean on the nail. <sighs> but if Clara leans on the nail, she'll wake Captain Cicero before she strikes a blow. No, no. He's excessively weary from so much fighting. Mrs. Gordon, perhaps you could steady Miss Van Sieven's shoulders she needs for you. That's it. That's it. Good. I hope you don't find all this a bore, Miss Van Sieven. Well, I cannot say that I like it very much. Oh, but you'll see it through, will you not, dearest Clara? Oh, yes, I'll see it through. Provided, of course, that no one prevents me. Do you mean your mother? Yes, Mrs. Broughton. Ah. She's discovered your shocking secret, has she? I think she has a suspicion. This morning she made a remark about artists that was not at all complimentary. Mm. And she stayed around with me as if she knew I had an appointment here and was deliberately trying to make it difficult for me. Well, that's why I was so late. Well, if your mother is about to spoil our fun, we should make the best use of our time. I agree. You should indeed. So, Conway, I will leave you if I may. Good luck in your endeavours. Do you think you will like the picture at all? No, not at all. Oh. oh, it's nothing to do with how you've painted me. I don't think I'd like a picture of anyone if you were banging a nail into another's head. Ah. Uh -uh. Are you angry with me? For telling the truth. No, indeed. Do take a rest. Oh. For my part, I should like the picture a great deal, if it brings me the particular success I've been craving. Oh, I'm told that everything you do is successful now, simply because it's you that's doing it. That is the worst of success, I suppose. <laughs> well, yes, I agree. And so much of the getting of success is due to chance. It's a lottery. You cannot complain. You have won the prize. I have. But there is another prize yet. Miss Van Siever. Clara, the success I dream of is not success in my profession. Is it not? Well, to be truthful, I don't care tuppence for the picture. If it was agreeable to you, I'd happily slit the canvas from top to bottom. Oh, for heaven's sake, you must do nothing of the kind. Why should you want to? Simply to show you that it is not for the sake of the picture that I'm here. Mr. Dalrymple, I I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, then, I shall tell you. Clara, dear... Clara. Um. My friends. My friends, why are you not working? Now, Mr. Dalrymple has been explaining to me the precarious nature of the artist's profession. It is not precarious with him. No, but to prove his argument, he was intending to give this woman in the picture a taste of her own medicine. I don't understand. It was all part of an attempt, Mrs. Broughton, to make the best use of my time. But the time you allowed me was, you know, very, very brief. When I was younger, I was quite careful as to money. But my late wife, the Lady Alexandrina, was a huge drain upon my resources and has continued to be so, even in death. She died where she had spent most of her married life, in Baden-Baden, and for my own part I would happily have left her there. But her family, the de Courses, insisted that I have her brought back to England and that I should pay the full cost of transportation and burial. Also, the little that remains of my income is still inextricably tied up in the hands of the de Courses' lawyer. 
and altogether I feel the dread curse of the de Courses lingers horribly on. You seem in low spirits, Crosby. I have been to the city to see Mr. Dobbs Broughton. Oh, yes. You had a loan from him, didn't you? I did, for 250 And I was hoping to obtain an extension of the loan. No good? Money's tight, says Mr. Broughton. At times like these, says Mr. Broughton, he must take all that's owing to him. And when I told him it didn't suit me to pay the loan, he became very uncivil. Mm. Said I must pay it without it suiting me. And... Pratt, look, on the grey, it's Bernard Dale. Oh, yes, your friend from the club. He's no longer at the club, and he's no longer my friend. No, of course, that dreadful business. I think he's noticed you. Yes, but he won't come over. Who's the young lady, I wonder? Ah, that's the girl he's marrying, I believe. Uh. Emily Dunstable, the niece of Mrs Thorne, who has all that money. I'm dining at Mrs Thorne's next week, as it happens. Really? I never dine out anywhere now. My life has become very... It's her. It is. Behind the Dunstable girl. She's wearing a blue cloak. Do you see her? Yes, I see her. You know her, I take it. That, dear fellow, is Lily Dale. Of Allington. Indeed. Indeed. Lily Dale. She has turned this way. Yes. Yes. There. She looked me in the eye. Oh. What am I to do? I'm not sure you need to do anything. I wrote to her mother a few weeks ago and I got put off. But now Lily Dale is here. She is here. And she is as pretty as ever. Oh, Lily, my sweetest love, my treasure, my own, my own. Well, what prevents it? Why should I not, at last, and after so many sufferings, make Lily Dale my own? Why should I not set to right the great wrong that was done? and turn unhappiness into lasting joy. <laughs> <laughs>